July 22nd, 1991. In the night streets of Milwaukee, two cops were patrolling around their vicinity. Everything has been quiet for their day. No major reports or close encounters so far. Unknowingly, these two cops are about to have the most horrific shift in their entire lives. When it was just a few minutes away for the two to finish their usual night shift, they encountered a top naked man in handcuffs waving for help. At first, they were thinking that the guy was just a drunk addict or a homeless freak, but after calming and questioning him, the man claimed that he was attempted to be held as captive and killed by a lunatic. As the police followed the report, they were brought to an apartment where they met its highly cooperative and calm-spoken owner named Jeffrey Dahmer. The owner welcomed them to continue their investigation, seemingly innocent of any transgression. Upon searching the place, the police noticed gay erotica posters on the walls, but the living area was well-maintained with designed plants and an electric aquarium centerpiece. When the police asked Dahmer about the handcuff scenario, he simply answered that it's a game he plays with boys that he picked up. The police, rolling their eyes, thought that they might be wasting their time over some gay drama of two men lovers who are simply love quarreling. Since both Dahmer and the complainant are of their matured age, the police wanted to conclude the case by just removing the cuffs. They asked Dahmer for the keys and he casually pointed out that it was on his bedroom table. When one of the cops started heading into Dahmer's room, he suddenly interrupted and offered to get it for them. Here's where the two policemen started to feel an eerie sense that Dahmer might be hiding something. Inside Dahmer's bedroom, the police noticed an unusually big drum of chemicals, a bed with blood-stained sheets, and a bedside cabinet table with open drawers. Inspecting closely, he noticed and picked up a collection of Polaroid photos inside the bedside drawers. Here's when he saw some of the most spine-chilling crimes in history. In the 74 photos he examined, he saw severed heads, dismembered body parts, and a body that was entirely skinned. There were photos of handcuffed dead men with missing body parts. In one of the pictures, there's a head covered in gold paint. There were skeletons and dead bodies in different poses, several cleaved male organs, an entire torso, bleached body parts, and many more extremely graphic and gory photographs of his multiple victims. What led Dahmer, who seemed like an average person, to commit some of the most horrific atrocities in U.S. history? What hindered society and caused the system to fail multiple times from stopping these felonies? Today on Crime Diaries, we head to Milwaukee, Wisconsin to explore the mass murder case of Jeffrey Dahmer. Jeffrey Lionel Dahmer was born on May 21, 1960 in Milwaukee, Wisconsin as the first son of Joyce Annette a teletype machine instructor, and Lionel Herbert Dahmer, a research chemist. Dahmer was deprived of attention as an infant. At an early age, he felt unsure of the solidity of the family, recalling extreme tension and numerous arguments between his parents during his early years. At elementary school, Dahmer was regarded as quiet and timid. One teacher later recollected she detected early signs of abandonment in Dahmer due to his father's absence and mother's illness. From his freshman year at Revere High School, Dahmer was seen as an outcast. At an early age of 14, he developed alcohol addiction, as he called it, my medicine. Among his few friends, Dahmer became something of a class clown who often staged pranks, which were goofy impressions of bleeding and seizures, dubbed as doing a Dahmer. On occasion, Dahmer would perform these antics for money to purchase more alcohol. When he reached puberty, Dahmer discovered he was gay. At around the same time, he started to acquire his fantasy of dominating and controlling a completely submissive male partner. From an early age, Dahmer manifested an interest in dead animals. His fascination with dead animals may have begun when, at the age of four, he saw his father removing animal bones. 
According to his father, he was oddly thrilled by the sound the bones made. He occasionally searched beneath and around the family home for additional bones and explored road kills to discover how the insides fit together. In one interview, Dahmer stated that he became curious about the differences between the bodies of humans and animals. This curiosity led him to murder 17 men. Dahmer committed his first murder in 1978. He picked up a hitchhiker named Stephen Mark Hicks, who was 18 at the time. He lured him to his house, promising more party time after the concert that Hicks had just attended. According to Dahmer, he got extremely aroused from Hicks's torso, and when he tried to leave after enjoying some beers and music, he hit his head with a dumbbell and killed him by strangling him with the dumbbell's bar. He then pleasured himself sexually off the corpse. Dahmer dissected the body and later buried the remains in his backyard. Weeks later, he came back and unearthed the body to pulverize the bones and spread it in a woodland's breeze. Six weeks after the murder, Dahmer was sent to the military. It was reported that during his enlistment, he raped his roommate for six months, but the officials didn't take the necessary steps as homophobia was rampant in those years. Dahmer was unable to finish his service and was sent home eventually for being an alcoholic. Upon getting back, he worked as a mixer in a chocolate factory. After work, he enjoys going to bathhouses, describing it as a relaxing place. During his sexual encounters, he became frustrated at his partners as they moved during the act. Dahmer said, and we quote, I trained myself to view people as objects of pleasure instead of people. In June 1986, Dahmer started administering sleep pills and sedatives to his partners to make them fall asleep before performing various sexual acts. Dahmer, over the years, was also arrested for lewd acts such as masturbating in public. On November 20, 1987, Dahmer met with his next victim, Stephen Tuomi, a 25-year-old man from Michigan. He lured him to the Ambassador Hotel in Milwaukee, where Dahmer had rented a room for the evening. According to Dahmer, he had no intention of murdering Tuomi, but rather intended to simply sedate him and lie beside him as he explored his body. The next morning, Dahmer woke up to Tuomi lying beneath him, dead. Dahmer said he had no memory of killing Tuomi. I had no intention of hurting him. When I woke up in the morning, he uh, had a broken rib here. I was heavily bruised. Apparently, I had uh, beaten him to death with my fists. And you have no memory I of it? I have no memory of it. But that's what started the whole spree all over again. Dahmer's insatiable desires went more rampant after Tuomi's murder. His modus operandi was to hunt victims from gay bars and lure them to his grandmother's house. He then sedates his victims with triazolam or temazepam before or shortly after engaging in sexual activity with them. And once the victim becomes unconscious with sleeping pills, he kills them and pleasures himself again with their remains. After a few more killings, Dahmer started collecting skulls in his grandmother's cellar. In one instance, Dahmer lured and drugged another young man to his house but was unable to kill him due to his grandmother finding out that he was letting other people into her house. Dahmer instead took the man to the county general hospital. In September 1988, Dahmer's grandmother had enough of him and asked him to move out. It was mainly because of his alcohol addiction, his habit of bringing young men to her house, and his issue with the corpse's smell. He moved to a one-bedroom apartment at 808 North 24th Street. Two days later after moving, he was arrested for sexual assault to a minor. Dahmer pleaded guilty and was registered as a sexual offender. Eventually, he was soon released by the virtue of parole. He temporarily moved back to his grandmother's house, but shortly moved in to 924 North 25th Street, apartment 213, after taking his fifth victim's mummified head and genitals with him. Within just one week of moving into his new apartment, Dahmer had killed his sixth victim, Raymond Smith. Smith was a 32-year-old male prostitute 
whom Dahmer lured to apartment 213 with the promise of $50 for sex. Just like his other victims, he lured him, gave him a drink laced with seven sleeping pills, then manually strangled him. Here's where Dahmer started his habit of taking photos of his victim's corpse in different poses using a Polaroid camera. To dispose of the bodies of his victims, he boils them with Soilex, a chemical which allows them to rinse the bones in his sink. Dahmer dissolves the remainder of the skeletons, excluding the skull. He later collects the skulls inside a metal filing cabinet, occasionally designing some with paint before storing them. In one notable instance, Dahmer accidentally drank the sedatives intended for his victim. When he woke up the next day, he found out that his intended victim had stolen from him. Dahmer didn't feel pity even for his acquaintances such as Edward Smith, a 28-year-old man. In similar fashion, he lured him to his apartment, drugged him, and strangled him to death with the goal of growing his skull collection. In this interview about his murder, Dahmer said that he felt rotten with Smith's death. But it was not because he was his acquaintance, but because he had made a mistake in preserving the skull. Less than three months after the murder of Smith, Dahmer started his habit of collecting more body parts and preserving them for cannibalism. He encountered a 22-year-old Chicago native named Ernest Miller. After performing his modus, Dahmer wrapped Miller's heart, biceps, and portions of flesh from his legs in plastic bags and placed them in the fridge for later consumption. Dahmer at some point did not kill anyone for almost five months, although on a minimum of five occasions between October 1990 and February 1991, he unsuccessfully attempted to lure men to his apartment. However, in February 1991, Dahmer resumed his operations. In just two months, he killed two more victims, bringing his kill count to 11 men at this point, performing his same modus of luring, drugging, killing, and pleasuring himself using their preserved body parts. Because of his frequent crimes, his fellow residents of the Oxford Apartments had started to repeatedly complain to the building's manager, Sopa Princewill, of the foul smells emanating from his apartment, in addition to the sounds of power tools and other weird loud noises. Dahmer's alibi was that his freezer broke, causing the contents to become spoiled. On May 24, 1991, Dahmer victimized a 31-year-old aspiring model named Tony Hughes. In this murder, Dahmer evolved his fantasy into rendering his victims to a zombie-like state. He wanted to disable them to a point wherein they are not dead, but are weak enough to be completely dominated. After drugging Hughes into unconsciousness, Dahmer injected hydrochloric acid into his skull. The drilling and injection, though, instantly killed the victim. In one of Dahmer's most infamous cases, the authorities almost saved a victim and had Dahmer in their hands, but ultimately failed to stop him. On the afternoon of May 26, 1991, Dahmer met a 14-year-old teenager named Conorak Synthesimphone. Conorak was the younger brother of the boy whom he had molested in 1988, but they both didn't know about the circumstance. He was able to successfully lure and drug the boy. Before he fell totally unconscious, Dahmer led the boy into his bedroom, where the body of Hughes, whom Dahmer had killed two days earlier, was located. Dahmer believed that the boy saw the body, yet did not react because of the effects of the sedation. On this occasion, Dahmer drilled a single narrow hole into the crown of the boy's skull, through which he injected hydrochloric acid into the frontal lobe, trying to make him his zombie. Dahmer then drank several beers while lying alongside him before briefly falling asleep. Dahmer then left his apartment to buy more alcohol. On his way back to his apartment, Dahmer found the boy sitting naked with three distressed young black women standing near him. Dahmer approached the women calmly and told them that the boy, whom he quickly gave a fake alias of Zhang Meng, was his friend. Dahmer attempted to drag the boy by the arm, but the three women sensed something was fishy, so they didn't allow Dahmer to take the boy. Two Milwaukee police officers, 
John Balserzak and Joseph Gabrish arrived. However, with Dahmer's relaxed demeanor, he told the officers that the boy was his 19-year-old boyfriend. He explained that the boy was too drunk and it's simply a gay lover's quarrel. Also adding that the boy frequently behaved in this manner when intoxicated. The three women got frustrated with the police not noticing the abuse and started pointing out evidence that the boy was harmed. Despite that, the officer harshly informed them to butt out, shut the hell up, and to not interfere. These questionable actions were allegedly driven by racial discrimination for the ladies being persons of color and the boy being Asian. In the end, the police sided with Dahmer and helped him bring the boy back to his apartment. The moment the three officers left from his apartment, Dahmer again injected hydrochloric acid into the boy's brain. On this second occasion, the injection killed the boy. He then started the dissolving and preserving process for the boy's corpse, as well as the three-day-old corpse of the model that he left in his bedroom. Two more skulls were added to his collection on this day. Since this missed opportunity of catching Dahmer, his murders then continued in the same fashion of attempting to zombify his victims and refrigerating selected body parts. A neighbor had reported Dahmer's suspicious actions to the police, however, they dismissed it, allegedly due to another discriminatory instance. Four more victims were killed, increasing the death toll to 17. July 22, 1991 Dahmer approached three men and offered $100 for their company to his apartment for nude photography modeling and beer drinking in an attempt to add them to his collection. One of the trio, 32-year-old Tracy Edwards, agreed to come. When Edwards entered the apartment, he instantly noted a foul odor and several boxes of hydrochloric acid on the floor, which Dahmer quickly claimed to be of use for cleaning bricks. In one of Dahmer's tricks, Edward turned his head to look at the aquarium. Dahmer quickly took advantage of this and sneakily tried to place a handcuff upon Edward's wrists. Edwards exclaimed, What's happening? Dahmer cuffed one of Edward's hands but unsuccessfully cuffed his wrist together. He then told Edwards to accompany him to the bedroom to pose for nude pictures. While inside the bedroom, Edwards noted nude male posters on the wall and that a videotape of The Exorcist 3 was playing. He also noted a blue 57-gallon drum in the corner from which a strong odor emanated. After some time passed, Dahmer started aggressively threatening Edwards with a knife and asked him to pose for nude pictures. In an attempt to appease Dahmer, Edwards unbuttoned his shirt, saying he would allow him to do so if he would remove the handcuffs in one of his hands and put the knife down. However, Dahmer ignored his request and simply turned his attention towards the TV. Dahmer, in one moment, placed his head on Edward's chest, listened to his heartbeat, and, with the knife pressed against his intended victim, informed Edwards he intended to eat his heart. In continuous attempts to prevent Dahmer's attacks, Edwards repeatedly convinced him that he's a friend and that he was not going to leave. Edwards was already planning his escape by either jumping from a window or running through the unlocked front door upon the next available opportunity. When Edwards next stated he needed to use the bathroom, he stood up and punched Dahmer in the face, knocking him off balance, fleeing out the front door. At 11.30 p.m. on July 22nd, Edwards asked for help from two Milwaukee police officers, Robert Routh and Rolf Mueller. The officers noted that Edwards had a handcuff attached to his wrist, which he was reporting as a deed by a lunatic. At first, the officers thought that Edwards was just a crazy drug addict, but when the cop's keys failed to release his handcuffs, the police escorted Edwards to the apartment where Dahmer resides. Upon arriving at the apartment, Dahmer welcomed the three and calmly acknowledged that he was the one who put the cuffs on Edwards' wrist. Edwards started reporting to the police that Dahmer previously threatened him with a knife. Tension rose and when the police asked for the keys, Dahmer pointed out that the key to the handcuffs was on top of his bedside drawer. As Officer Mueller headed to the bedroom, Dahmer rushed to pass the officer, offering to retrieve the key for them. This alarmed the second officer present, Ralph, who commanded Dahmer to back off. Inside the spooky bedroom, 
Mueller saw an open drawer which contained Polaroid pictures. The subject of the photographs are the dismembered and severed bodies of Dahmer's previous victims. Mueller also noticed that the photos had been taken in the same apartment in which they were standing at that moment. Mueller walked into the living room to show them to his partner, exclaiming, These are for real. Dahmer saw that Mueller was holding several of his Polaroid photos, and in a desperate attempt to escape from being arrested, he fought the officers. The officers overpowered Dahmer, restrained him, and called for backup. Mueller continued searching the apartment, and to his shock, a severed head was inside Dahmer's refrigerator. Dahmer, then pinned to the ground, looked at the officers and said the words, For what I did, I should be dead. More investigations were conducted into the apartment by the Milwaukee Police's Criminal Investigation Bureau. In total, they found four severed heads in Dahmer's kitchen. A total of seven skulls, some painted, some bleached, were found in Dahmer's closet. Investigators discovered collected blood, two human hearts, and a portion of arm muscle upon the shelves of the refrigerator. In Dahmer's freezer, investigators uncovered a torso and a bag of human organs. They also found two skeletons, severed hands, preserved male genitals, and a mummified scalp. In the 57-gallon drum inside his room, three more torsos were found as they were drenched, dissolving in the acid solution. The police found a total of 74 Polaroid pictures detailing the dismemberment of Dahmer's victims. Detective Patrick Kennedy interviewed Dahmer for over 60 hours. Dahmer was extremely calm and kept a natural demeanor in his conversations with the authorities. Dahmer, without any hesitation, admitted killing 16 young men in Wisconsin since 1987, with one further victim, Stephen Hicks, killed in Ohio back in 1978. Dahmer openly explained his modus of drugging the victims before killing them. He confessed to engaging in necrophilia, the act of having sexual intercourse with a dead body. Dahmer detailed that in his murders, he first removes their internal organs, then suspends the torso so the blood drains into his bathtub, before dicing any organs he did not wish to retain and separating the flesh from the body. The bones he wished to dispose of were pulverized or acidified with chemicals and bleach solutions. Dahmer also confessed that he ate his victims' hearts, livers, biceps, and portions of thighs by tenderizing the flesh and consuming them in meals flavored with various condiments. He had a goal of making an altar of skulls, stating that he would have completed it if the arrest did not happen. Dahmer went to a lot of trials, and even though he's suffering from mental illnesses, he still pleaded guilty. He was then sentenced to a 16th term of life imprisonment on May 1, 1992. In jail, Dahmer became a Christian, and on the morning of November 28, 1994, Dahmer left his cell to conduct his assigned work detail. He was moved to a shared cell, together with two fellow inmates, Jesse Anderson and Christopher Scarver. The trio were left unchecked in the showers of the prison gym for about 20 minutes. A few moments later, Dahmer was discovered on the floor of the bathroom, suffering from extreme head wounds. He was clubbed in the head and face with a 20-inch metal bar. His head had also been repeatedly smacked against the wall in the assault. Dahmer was still alive by that time, but in the hospital, he was pronounced dead one hour later. Anderson, one of Dahmer's cellmates, had been killed the same way two days later. The third prisoner, Scarver, who was serving a life sentence for murder, confessed to the authorities that he did the assaults. After attacking both men, Scarver returned to his cell and informed a prison guard, saying the words, God told me to do it. Jesse Anderson and Jeffrey Dahmer are dead. According to him, Dahmer did not yell or make any noise as he was being clubbed down. Upon learning of his death, Dahmer's mother Joyce responded angrily to the media. Now is everyone happy? Now that he's bludgeoned to death, is that good enough for everyone? The response of the families of Dahmer's victims was mixed. Some celebrated the news, while others were saddened. I am happy and very excited 
that the monster is finally dead. I am not surprised. I had predicted that he would be killed in prison because he had a death wish. He always had a death wish. Be put to death for his crimes. Uh, the question was, am I sinning against God by continuing to live? Whoever did kill him, he's my hero. I will be sending a thank you card to this hero. Anybody who sits back and says that they don't think that race had something to do with this probably isn't on the same planet. Catherine Lacey, the mother of victim Oliver Lacey, remarked, The hurt is worse now because he's not suffering like we are. The district attorney who prosecuted Dahmer cautioned against turning Scarver into a folk hero, noting that Dahmer's death was still murder. On May 15, 1995, Scarver was sentenced to two additional terms of life imprisonment for the murders of Dahmer and Anderson. Rain or shine, sharing your dreams, your heart and your mind. Dahmer had stated in his will that he wished for no services to be conducted and that he wished to be cremated. Dahmer has been long gone, but the world will never forget his monstrous crimes. Dahmer's tragic story is a reminder of how our society and system failed to protect its people due to discrimination. What are your thoughts about the case of Jeffrey Dahmer? Tell us in the comments section. Also, make sure to like this video, subscribe to our channel, and hit the bell icon to get the latest updates. This has been Crime Diaries, and until next time, don't be another statistic.